Hello and welcome to Castle's Corner. I'm joined with Mr. Jerry again. It's been a while, interfering circumstances, but he's back to talk about a topic which I've been getting a lot of questions about. I know you've answered this many times. I'd probably how many times I don't know, but we're gonna get nuanced into the video as to why some people can take steroids and get amazing results really rapidly. Some people take steroids, nothing happens. Some people take steroids and they get mediocre gains. Now, this is a very convoluted subject, and uh, we, we we actually just covered it briefly, but uh, we'll get into the details now. In summary, uh, if I may, Jerry, in summary, it is usually uh, inadequate protein or nutritional intake. It is inadequate sleep. It is not correcting the select, uh, like correct intensity and frequency of your workouts, and also not cor like correctly selecting the actual exercises you should be doing, generally speaking. Now, genetics come into a play, but I would really say that genetics are, I mean, kind of one of the final pieces that would prevent you from making fast progress on steroids. I mean, but did I, did I summarize that, Jerry? And of course, that's, welcome back. We love having you on. No, that's correct. Everything you said is just correct. Uh, but it, it's true. I mean, there's uh, all those reasons. A lot of people look at steroids and growth hormone and various anabolic drugs as magical substances uh, there are people, especially people that don't work out and not even involved in bodybuilding or exercise, that'll look at photos of elite, let's say, professional bodybuilders, and you know they they're familiar with steroids. I mean, they know they kind of have an idea what they do, and they make statements like those guys are all steroids, with the implication being that taking steroids alone is what produce those type of physiques, which anyone who knows any even even a a minuscule amount of information about steroids knows how silly that is, uh, because as I've said in, in past interviews, I witnessed some of the champion bodybuilder, uh, just to name one, Arnold Schwarzenegger in his heyday, uh, I saw he had a number of training partners. Arnold was generous to them with his steroid program. He gave them, actually gave them the same drugs he used. I mean, he put it, gave them the same program. And I could tell you, maybe let's say about 12 different training partners, not a single one of them, not a single one ever came close to making the gains Arnold did. I'm not saying that they didn't look good, but they didn't, you know, it was Arnold was more responsive to steroids. Arnold and the two bodybuilders that I've seen, uh, maybe I, I don't really know him well enough to say, but possibly Sergio Oliva could be in there too. But the two bodybuilders that I've witnessed who are most responsive to steroids was Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny Padilla. I mean, these guys. You wouldn't could, include Dorian Yeh? No, no, not well, not really. No, because Dorian, he claims, you know, that he didn't use a lot of steroids. I mean, in his current interviews, I think a lot of what Dorian's physique uh, resulted from a combination of fantastic genetic response. He was very mesomorphic and also the way he trained. He trained like a maniac. He trained extremely heavy and extremely intensely. We've talked about this before. He was very much into high intensity. When you get a combination like Durian had of very, very high intensity training and excellent genetics, the steroids, sure, they make a difference. But in other words, I think the other two factors produce were more responsible for what Durian's physique ultimately became than the drugs he took. Oh. Now, when I the reason I say Arnold and Danny Padilla it's because I've witnessed these got these two guys, you know, during when they don't have a contest coming up, they tend to slack off on their training years ago. Sometimes they train, take off for a couple of months, not even train. Like Danny would take off six months. He'd go back to New York, Rochester. He'd work in his father's store and he wouldn't work out at all. That's and then crazy he'd, come to back to, he'd come back to LA with no physique. He'd look like a little pudgy guy with no, you know, you wouldn't even know this guy was ever a bodybuilder. And Arnold, would get in fantastic shape. And then he would train about a, maybe 20 minutes, three, four times a week between contests, but he would get off the drugs and he'd shrink down to nothing too. In Arnold's case, his deltoids would disappear. His pecs, this huge slab-like pecs he had would be gone. The only thing he had left was a big bicep. His biceps never left. His triceps would disappear and his calves. Mm -hmm. For some reason, his calves stayed big even during the off season. Well, that's but, why he was accused of implants, I believe. Exactly, it was that is, that, yeah. That's true. But now both of these men, when they start to use the steroids, and again, they there's rumors about Arnold. I mean, Arnold recently said that 
he reveals, you know, a the, the couple of uh, articles appeared on the internet. Arnold reveals his steroid program for the first time. Arnold claims he took, uh, what was it, three Dianabol, which would be 15 milligrams, and 100 milligrams of testosterone a week. That was oh. it. And that, I, I know for a fact, I mean, Arnold is, I'm going to put it bluntly, he's a fucking liar. Yes. I mean, everyone knows, yes. I know for a fact his favorite steroid, which he didn't even mention, was what he had shipped in directly from Germany, because it was the real stuff back then, called Primabolin. Yep. That was his favorite, and he also liked Decaderablin. He might he have taken it. Arnold. There, I mean, been... there's there's so many stories. I've heard so many stories from so many bodybuilders who trained with Arnold who literally talked about the handfuls of D-ball he would take. Exactly, before, right. So like literal right. handfuls yeah. of D-ball. Yeah. yeah, that's another thing. I mean, I mean, especially when he was getting big in his earlier years, the stories were he was taking just like, like you say, huge amounts of, of steroids, you know, which would make sense. because you see how fast he grew? Mm -hmm. Let's say age 16 to 18, he was like twice his size. So, you know, but the point I'm trying to make is that Arnold and Danny, within six weeks after starting their anabolic program, their whole body changed. They looked like oh, yeah. super bodybuilders. And my point, they were very, very responsive to steroids. Now, in contrast, I've seen other bodybuilders not as uh, illustrious as these guys. These guys were like, nobody ever heard of them. They took the same type of steroid programs as Massive. the bodybuilding champions, and they got almost no results at all. I mm -hmm. mean, like nothing. There was one guy I know, he was kind of an eccentric guy from Brooklyn. Named, his name was Victor. And uh, he took a huge amount of steroids. And he had literally no physique. I felt sorry for the guy. He, he was so, so into bodybuilding. I mean, he was really like he lived and ate and slept bodybuilding. And he took the drugs and he just nothing. He had like 16 inch on. Nothing ever happened. He just had, I, I believe in his case, he trained pretty hard, but he had just crappy genetics. He actually did not respond to steroids. And that's another situation where, you know, you could be taking the real drugs and you just don't have the genetic response. Why that happens is questionable. It could be related to what they call androgen receptors. These are the receptors in the body that testosterone and all androgen anabolic drugs, they have to interact with the androgen receptor. There's only one kind of androgen receptor. There's two or three kinds of estrogen receptor. But in other words, the more androgen, they've shown this in studies. Let's say you have two guys starting out who never trained with weights, right? Make them twins too, make them twins. Okay, well, twins. It, 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 the it, genetics it, are all, but the genetics are always different. I've seen completely different responses. Well, at least okay. I've personally seen completely different responses. Okay, well, let's say fraternal twins, just to make it easy. All right, one, one twin has a, let's say a natural abundance of androgen receptors already, right? The other twin has far less androgen receptors. When they, they start working on the same exact exercise program, same weights, everything, the guy with the androgen receptors is going to make gains two to three times faster than the guy with less androgen receptors because his body is kicking out the testosterone and the testosterone is interacting with the androgen receptors and there's your muscle building effects, see? Eh? So there's that factor too. But yeah, not to not to go off on a side tangent. We talked about this before. I don't remember if it was on the podcast, but I've yeah. seen I haven't seen evidence for this, but it it actually does seem logical. But I, I've I've seen no evidence for it. I've seen a lot of pros talk about how if you just keep taking huge amounts of drugs, your body literally just develops more androgen receptors. I don't know if that's possible or not. Okay, I used to the original thought. When they, uh, the, let's say the uh, uh, anabolic steroid research years ago, researchers felt that, see, receptor cell receptors tend to shut down. They call it down regulation <clears throat> when they're bombarded by a certain hormone. A good example of that is beta receptors. Mm. For example, beta adrenic receptors. Let's take another drug, clenbuterol, popular drug. Bodybuilders use it to get, uh, to lose body fat. Uh, some think it builds muscle, but the truth is you have to take massive amounts of clenbuterol to build muscle and the amounts to build muscle would cause heart problems. So it's strictly, let's say it's a cutting drug, right? There's a certain amount of truth to that. But It's a, it's a respiratory drug primarily. Right, right, exactly. But the point is, it's actually used to treat asthma. But the thing is, a beta-2 agonist, it's called, beta-2 adrenic agonist. The beta receptors, unfortunately, are extremely sensitive. 
So when you take a, a beta receptor drug like clenbuterol, within about three weeks, the, the, the receptors actually shut down. They call it down regulation. When that happens, you could take a ton of clenbuterol. It's not going to do anything for you. So mm -hmm. bodybuilders have tried to work around that by taking clenbuterol every two to three days to extend the life. There's another drug called ketotifin, ketotifin I think it's called. It's a uh, antifungal drug that for some strange reason tends to keep the beta receptors open maybe two or three weeks longer than normal. So instead of shutting down in three weeks, they'll shut down in six weeks. I don't think the bodybuilders that they know about this. This was years ago. I haven't heard of any bodybuilders that are using that, that technique. Maybe they do. If they do, I don't know about it. I've heard something very similar, but I'm I'm struggling to remember it now. But it was a, it was literally an antifungal medication that was used to extend something. But I'm, I'm drawing a blank on it. It could be something different. Well, like, ketotifin is an antifungal, but the, but the thing is that I've uh, heard of it though. Yeah, the th but the thing is that that my point is that receptors tend to be sensitive. You, you know what I mean? Now, so they figure the scientists figure androgen receptors are the same way. If you bombard them, now your male body produces nine to eleven milligrams of testosterone a day, depending on which textbook you. Every textbook it's maddening because every biochemistry textbook lists a different it's amount. Different of yeah. So who knows? But let's say it's in the range of nine to eleven milligrams for the average per man, right? Now. You, you got a body balloon who's taking 500 milligrams, 1,000 milligrams a week of testosterone, and the body is set up to only accept 9 to 11 milligrams. Where the hell is all that testosterone uh -huh. going to go? So scientists looked at that, and they and they deduced. They said, well, what's it, what it's going to do, it's going to shut down the androgen receptors because they can't handle the load, and the steroids are going to not work. They're not going to work. But it turns out, there's a scientist who published a study in the mid 80s named Forbes. I don't remember his first name. It was the journal of metabolism. He did some research starting with animals and he found that androgen receptors respond differently. When you take more steroids, new androgen receptors open up mm. to accept the extra amount of testosterone. But there's still a limit. In other words, it doesn't go on forever. Where, where in other words, if you're taking, let's say, boatloads of steroids, your body's going to keep opening up androgens. After a while, you know, the androgen receptor, uh, let's say, uh, uh, synthesis peaks. So these guys that are taking, again, back to, let's say, 15,000 milligrams of testosterone, like Dallas McCarver. Yeah, over a gram, basically, a week. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's no way, there's no way that any body, any human body will accept that much. You know, just 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 because we're talking steroids now, this is a, a I think a beneficial thing to mention as well is more is not better as we're covering. But right. on a on a separate note, though, taking more of something like testosterone as a so-called base is not necessary. All steroids are derivative of, of testosterone. Having testosterone right. as a base like that and using a gram or something, all that's going to do is dramatically raise your estrogen, your progesterone, right. your prolactin rather. It's going to literally just make all of the side effects considerably worse. And as far as I know, there's no additional benefit to all of the extra drugs you're pumping in yourself. I mean, am I wrong about that? No, you're right. Uh, you're right. However, taking like I, like I say, if you take, let's say, extra amount of steroids, like the orals and a couple of, uh, let's say, moderate amounts of the injectables, your body will open up androgen receptors. You will be using a lot of the steroids, right? But as far as the, the estrogen, those effects, bodybuilders learned years ago, this process called aromatization, mm -hmm. where an enzyme called aromatase converts androgens, including testosterone, into estrogen. So they started using drugs like tamoxifen citrate, sold as Novadex, which basically blocks the androgen receptor because it's very structurally similar to estrogen. So if you take Novadex, it blocks the estrogen receptor. So even if the body's producing extra estrogen, and some of the guys, by the way, who take large amounts of steroids produce, get this, more estrogen than women. They yeah, produce more estrogen than women. And women produce like 10 times more estrogen normally than men. It's reversed for testosterone. But testosterone, men produce tes 10 times more testosterone than women. So what the body will start doing is taking Novadex to block the estrogen side effects, such as subcutaneous fat formation, gynecomastia, male breast formation. Yeah. Then later on, you had the aromatase inhibitor drugs, 
like anastrozole came out, Arimidex, and that kind of superseded the uh, the Navidex. But a, a strange thing that very few people know is that let's say a bodybuilder is concerned about gynecomastia. Turns out Navidex is better for treating and preventing gynecomastia than the aromatase inhibitors. I'm not sure why, but that's what they found in studies. So, and the problem with the aromatase inhibitors is that they're kind of like a shotgun approach. The, the actual purpose of the drugs is to treat usually postmenopausal estrogen sensitive breast cancer. That's what they were designed for. In mm -hmm. that case, you, you know, let's say anastrozole, you give like one milligram a day. Now, one milligram a day of anastrozole will knock out 80% of estrogen production. Now, that's a little, now, so if a man takes, let's say, one pill of, estro, of uh, anastrozole, uh, aromedex a day, they're basically cutting off their estrogen production, and that can lead to a lot of health problems. I, you I was just, I was just, just, you don't want to have a lot of estrogen as a man, but you have to have a certain amount. For one thing, estrogen is needed to promote nitric oxide release. The reason why women don't have cardiovascular disease until they reach menopause is their estrogen level maintains nitric oxide system. Nitric oxide, in turn, maintains the suppleness or the flexibility of the arteries. And, and when their arteries are flexible, there's less arterial sclerosis and there's less cardiovascular disease. See? But and also estrogen is important for brain health. See? So a man does not want to cut down his, but nonetheless- In sexual health, sexual health too? Yeah, sexual health. But the bodybuilders, because they're taking such massive amounts, as you say, of the testosterone, they have to take uh, some sort of estrogen blocker inhibitor, or they get massive estrogen. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, and as far as the progesterone, that uh, pro uh, uh, was it not not progesterone. What's the other one? Prolactin. 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 Yeah, prolactin. Uh, that varies with individuals, but with prolactin, the big problem with prolactin, prolactin is kind of like a. It's made in males too. But in women, as, as the term implies, prolactin, it stimulates the letdown reflex that starts the breastfeeding process. That's what prolactin does, right? In fact, if a man, this is crazy. If a man's, this is a really crazy thing. If a man's prolactin level gets high enough, he can actually start to produce milk through his breast. If he, if he squeezes his nipple every day, he's going to start getting milk coming out of it, believe it or not. But more importantly, and this is what a lot of men don't like, when you when your prolactin level goes high, your erections go low. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or or if it's too low, or if it's or if your uh, or if your estrogen or your, sorry, excuse me, if your estrogen level is too high or your estrogen level is too low, there goes by, you know, your sexual yeah, health, no more sexual right, health. Right. So I see so I see a lot of guys what they'll do, well, at least before I email them. I don't know what they do after I talk to them. But a lot of guys will ask me, you know, the basic steroid questions. I'm like, listen, I'm not a steroid guru. Don't ask me these questions. I'll just give you the, you know, don't hurt yourself. Here's the basics. But one thing that I just see all the time, I don't know if it's the mentality of the world, but it's basically, I'm going to take all of the drugs and then I'll just take this little pill and it'll fix everything. Right. And, and, and I'm talking about like Novadex and Aramidex, these things, of course. Right. And that is not how it works. No, Even exactly. having that attitude is entirely the, the wrong attitude. These pills don't fix you. It's like fighting fire with fire inside of a, a, a glass house. Like, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, well, like I say, ahead. it's like I say, I mean, let's say they take something to, let's say, block or inhibit estrogen. That's only, you know, curing one problem with the mm -hmm. mass. All right, now you're con controlling your estrogen, fine. But it doesn't handle all the other problems that high dose have, the cardiovascular effects, the brain effects, you know, all these other effects. Mood are not, swings, and right. mood swings, the sleep, the, sweat, exactly. the sweats. Those, those things still exist. Mm -hmm. As you say, there's no one pill that's going to magically erase the possible side effects of high dose steroid regime. It's not going to happen. I mean, just to just to get anecdotal, I guess, about with two things real quick. Uh, number one, obviously, you guys all know I've taken steroids before many times. I've experimented with them. And I, I have no trouble admitting that when I take something like Test, Trend, and D-Ball, I get gigantic. I look huge. I swell up really fast. I look really big. I was My heaviest was 250 when I was taking all that stuff. I was big, and I didn't like it. I couldn't breathe. I mean, I, I literally, just did, it's not my thing. I, I like to be about 215. That's that's where I like to be. But, but they, they, 
How tall are you? Six two. Oh, you, I didn't know you were that tall. Okay. No, I'm, I'm tall. Yeah, I'm tall. Got so I got really long limbs. Like right now, a tiny little arm, you know? No, no, but, no, it's not bad. No, it's not bad. But I, 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 for some reason, you know, you can't tell when you're seeing a guy. No, I know. I look, yeah. I know. Well, yeah. I believe me, the commenters know. Uh, <laughs> oh, two, no, I was going to say 215 is a good weight for you, I, I, so. I mean, that's when I, that's when I look my best. It was also before a lot of my injuries and stuff. But I mean, it, it, but regardless, of, that's anecdotally. They do work. They work, by the way, just great with the Brig 20 exercises, the stuff I talk about, correct biomechanical right. exercise. I was that big, by the way, guys, when I was, I was not doing squats, deadlift, or bench press. That's when I was already training correctly, just so you all know. Right. Uh, but the second anecdotal thing I'd like to say is just, you don't need steroids for anything unless you are determined and have a fiery passion to be a top athlete or a bodybuilder. There's right. no reason to take them unless it's some form of TRT, which is the same thing as a steroid. I mean, it is. But unless it's some form of TRT or unless you have a literal competition you're very serious about or you are an athlete or you're recovering or something, that's, that's my take on it. I have seen, and I know you have too, so many guys destroy their marriages, their relationships with people, friends and family, because they're injecting themselves with drugs and don't know what they're doing, completely altering their brain chemistry, their mood, their persona, and then they don't want to stop taking the drugs because suddenly that becomes who they are. Okay. This is not a healthy mindset. Let me underscore what you're saying here. For years, I've written in my Applied Metabolics publication before that in Bodybuilding Magazine, whenever I've just, I had a column in I am in for about 20 over 20 years called bodybuilding pharmacology where I talk about various drugs related to bodybuilding and all that stuff but I've always pointed out that I can never understand why anybody who's not going to go into a competition uh you know uh, would would eat, resort to taking steroids and not only that but it, it is true though I, I will admit one thing and I, I as I, I I tell people I competed as a bodybuilder. I was natural. I didn't take any drugs. I dropped out of body of bodybuilding competition because I had to make a decision whether to take steroids. I'd come to the point where I progressed to a certain point and to get any higher or going to more, let's say, upper level competition, I'd have to get on an even playing field with the others. I thought about it. I thought about the, but just remember, this is, this is in the 70s. Half the side effects weren't even known then. But what was known was that steroids can cause male pad and baldness. I didn't want to experience that because I had the genetics. But my, both my grandfathers were bald when they were 30. So I didn't want to, I said, that's enough. I'm not, it's not worth it. There wasn't any big rewards. Even the pro contests, were, they weren't being paid much money. It wasn't worth it. So I said, I'm going to train the rest of my life, but I'm done with competition. My point being, I can never understand if you're going to go into competition, 90, and I'm not talking about low level, I'm talking about upper level. My philosophy is do as go as if you're if you're interested in competition, go as far as you can naturally. Use natural methods, train hard, good nutrition, plenty of sleep, rest. Then, if you want to go into competition, compete for a while. You know, uh, uh, still natural, get in the best shape you can. You know, get ripped up, get lower your body fat. If you feel that you want to go to an upper echelon let's say national contests or in very rare cases, professional, that's very rare, then that's when you want to consider steroids. But the truth of the matter is, if you look at the, the statistics, and it's shocking, most of the people that are taking steroids today are, have no interest in competition. Mm -hmm. They're not bodybuilders. They're not athletes. They just go on these, you know, internet, and they see these steroid regimes. They have this idea in their head that you can't get a great physique without using anabolic drugs, which is so stupid, so dumb. I would, so I would even say a, a lot of it is just literally people want a shortcut. I, again, you probably deal with this a lot, but they just, I, I don't know what it is. They don't want to be, I think, so for me, I think it's kind of cool. It's romantic, it's heroic, however you want to look at it going to the gym, the gym, developing the discipline, learning the principles, applying them with massive intensity, generating more intensity every time you go. This for me is a mental struggle against myself. This right. is fun. This is, I enjoy this. I like going to battle with myself like this. I like learning more. 
it yeah. seems most people they want it they want it now they don't care how they get it how many years it takes off their life what the repercussions are they have it's like the marshmallow experiment these motherfuckers can't wait for a second marshmallow they gotta just they have the first one uh right. they don't care they, they they literally they just are covered in their instagram youtube facebook TikTok with all these bodies of people and all these bullshit that they're never going to look like that but they want it so right. they're like well which which drug should i start with i'm like how about a nun how about that you right. know but apparently yeah. i'm one of the only people who says that everybody's freaking coach I, i've seen other coaches plans they literally just openly discuss steroids with them left and right here or there they're not even trying to dissuade them well i'll tell you that's a that's a mistake and you know then there's the, they, they have a really some dangerous trends uh no like, pun intended well yeah no two that i could think of for example are first of all just the acquisition of steroids i mean most of the time most doc i don't really know of any doctors physicians that'll just give out steroids willy-nilly uh, yes there's plenty that do testosterone replacement therapy if you're clinically shown to be low in testosterone don't get me wrong but a young healthy guy who comes to a doctor and he has let's say normal testosterone 99 percent of doctors will say no because first of all, they're monitored by the Drug Enforcement Agency. They can lose their license. So where do they get the steroids? They get it from black market mm -hmm. internet sites. The problem there, every two, three months, a new study comes out where these uh, scientists and or researchers, they, they analyze steroids that were seized from raids of various black market uh, steroid sales groups, whatever they are. They, they, they actually- Warehouses. Yeah, they analyze the drugs. And what they find is usually about half to 75% of them are either mismarked, they're, they're, they're mislabeled, meaning they contain another steroid that's not on the label, or they could, they don't contain the potency on the label, or the worst case scenario, oh, that's, that's not the worst, the worst, the third one is they contain no steroid, yep. but maybe vitamin B12 or something like that. Yep. But the worst case scenario, the scary part is, they could contain stuff like heavy metals, mm. including arsenic. One body in Australia sent away for trenbolone, 30 year old healthy guy. Turns out that the drug was tainted with enough arsenic to kill him. He was a healthy guy. He, he, he you know, he sent away for trenbolone and he died. Mm. So, you know, that's the problem. And then speaking of trenbolone, trenbolone to me is an insane steroid. I, I mean, I've noticed that there's quite a few videos lately of people making uh, videos warning. And some of these are hardcore guys. They're warning others, don't use Trenbolone. Oh, good, good. Trenbolone is a horrible steroid, horrible. Yeah. First of all, it hasn't been made by, it was made many years ago briefly by a legitimate company called, they called it Parabolin. Didn't last very long. They took it off the market. Then they came out with Finijet, which was a, a animal pellet form that but people were kind of melting down and putting an injection. But the point is, it hasn't been made by a legitimate pharmaceutical company in years. It's only made by black market. But that the worst part is Trenbolone. It's a very powerful steroid. And if it is real Trenbolone, I'm not going to lie. It'll make you very big and strong. It's very powerful. It really is. But animal studies show it causes changes in the brain that lead to brain damage, and, and also it increases the uh, normal folded proteins called beta amyloid and tau that are known to cause Alzheimer's disease. So mm -hmm. what does that mean? That means bodybuilders who start on Trembolone and you know they like the effect, let's say they're getting real Trembolone, which is a, you know, it's a crapshoot. They may or may not be real if they get- Rare, but possible, yeah. But let's say it's real. They're gonna get big and strong, they're gonna grow and they're gonna get almost addicted to it. So they're gonna take it year after year after year. But let's say they start at 25. If they make it to 40, they're going to, by that time, they're probably going to have no mind. They're going to probably uh, be demented or they're going to die of heart disease before that. <clears throat> so it's, it's, it's an insane drug that, you know, when I've said this in past videos, people leave comments, oh, trend balloon works, well, this guy's full of crap. I'm not going to listen to him. It works. Good. You know, all I can say is, you know, you buy your ticket, you take your chances, like they say. You want to take Trembolone, go ahead, but you've been warned. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, you know, 
A lot of people don't care. Um, I mean, I went through a period in my life where I didn't care about consequences. I just wanted to get thin down whoever I had to step on, you know, et cetera, whatever. But a lot of people are like that or experiencing things like that where they think that they are like that and they're not really like that. That happens a lot as well, actually. Yeah. Um, but uh, just getting it back to the, the subject at hand. So, for example, I mean, this is very specific, I suppose, not, not for example, but why are the Olympians the Olympians? Because, frankly, it's not the drugs. It's not the exercises. They're doing the same exercises as everybody else around them is doing them. The other hundreds, millions of people who want to be Olympians, you know, all these people want to be them. But only, what are there, like 300 pros right now who are actually good pros? I guess so, yeah. I, I maybe, maybe. They, well, they give out pro cards like crazy. Years yeah, ago, that's why I said good pros. You know, good I mean, pros. Years, years ago, you actually had to earn a pro card by winning certain contests. Well, it, today, you know when... I mean, you go online, they got these people I've never heard of, and they like to call themselves Joe Smith, IFBB Pro. Yeah. Thinking, Who the hell is this guy? How did he get a pro? You know, what did he win to get a pro uh, status? You know, you still got to pay for your pro card. You have to pay for your own pro card. Oh, yeah, card, you got to pay for it. Yeah, still, exactly. to this day, you still, I, that is so crazy to me. The only sport where athletes have to pay for their pro card and know, pay for everything. Yeah, they got to pay for the. Uh, I really thought years ago that was going to get like fixed. It's still not fixed. I, I just looked into it again. No, no, you have to understand the, the so-called bodybuilding federations. They're they're crooks. Oh, they're, they're selfish and, and they're yeah. crazy. I mean, there's been a, a series of articles in the Washington Post about some of the antics they use. They're basically like a little little mafia type of organization. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, they call themselves nonprofit. They get all this money. They they charge sanction fees for contests. They charge for pro cards, they charge for entering the contest. Everything. They, they charge the promoter. They get all these, all this money. It goes right in their pocket. They, they don't give back nothing back. They don't give a goddamn thing no, back. They don't get good nothing. venues. They get terrible venues. They, they're showing terrible off venues. the best guys in the world who have dedicated their lives and sacrificed years off their lives, yeah. literally, and they're giving them shit venues. You know, you know, my favorite story related to that years ago. They were supposed to have a Chicago professional bodybuilding contest, right? The promoter, however, they had all these top pros at the time, Boyer Cole, all these other guys were training for months for this contest, right? At the last minute, it turns out the promoter didn't, didn't sell enough tickets to cover his expenses. Now, remember, he had to pay something like a $20,000 uh, uh, fee. I forgot what it was called to hold the IFBB to hold the contest. That's it gets nothing from it, right? <clears throat> so he 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 called Ben Weeder, who was the head of the IFBB, and he appealed to Ben Weeder. He said, "Please, could you could you help me out with this? I want to hold the show. All these guys have trained hard for months, but I'm not selling enough tickets. Could, I need some financial help." Ben Weeder basically, not quote unquote, told him to go fuck himself. And, and and I never forgot that. And I, this was firsthand information. This was not a rumor. I got this as for, I said to myself, for all this bullshit about how he wants to get, uh, you know, bodybuilding the Olympics and blah, blah. I said, they're full of shit. Yeah. And that includes Joe Weider, Ben Weider. All these guys were full of shit. They, they, all they cared about was money. They didn't care anything about helping the bodybuilders. Not no. Now, now, back in that time, there was literally about 20 bodybuilders ever. Like at, at that time, they were all the same competitions. They were all the same, like literally just a very select few bodybuilders. And even today, when there's so many more people and bodybuilding is mainstream and people want to have these amazing physiques, there's still not that many pros and there's really not that many good pros. Right. So obviously the, the answer is generally what I give kind of long story short, the answer is okay. Do you have optimum training conditions? Do you have optimum sleep and health? And are you taking drugs? How long have you been? And you look like this, it's unlikely you should compete. You, right. you know, like you gotta be real with people sometimes. You know what I mean? Like there's, I just, I won't give names, but the other week I had a guy, uh, let's say good mid physique, but he was at 45. He'd been taking steroids for the better part of 15 years. And he, he looked like an average gym bro. Right. Um, you know what I mean? And I, I told him, I'm like, I understand you want to compete this and the other, we should get you to the competition, but you're just understand, you know, realistically where you stand. You got to tell people these things. I think it's cruel not to. Well, you know what, you know what the odd thing about that, those kind of guys 
who don't respond to steroids, like a guy like you're describing, let's say he can't get the, the mass, you know, the real hugeness that, that really stands out. Those guys have only one hope if they want to compete. They can still compete. Conditioning, yeah. They, exactly. What they should do, instead of trying, and, and a famous bodybuilder actually did this, Frank Zane, who won the Mr. Olympia yep. three times, yep. there came a point when he was young. Giant when, killer. Right, when he realized he had a very light bone structure, only had six inch wrists, five foot nine, couldn't hold, when he got to 200 pounds, he was already bulky. He could, mm -hmm. only, could only hold maybe 170 to 180 in muscular shape. But he came to the realization that I'm never going to really be, when I get too big, I don't look good. I'm not going to be able to compete. So rather than try and get big and, you know, and get on the level of some of these other guys, I'm going to get ripped and shredded and get so refined that I'm still going to beat the guys that are much bigger than me because I will look better than them on stage. And it proved very successful for him. Mm -hmm. He won three Mr. Olympias. Beat Arnold Schwarzenegger in 68 because Arnold was big and bulky at the time. And Arnold was literally twice as big as him. he still beat him. But the point being that guys like that who cannot get big, even with steroids, their best bet is to study diet, study nutrition, be very dedicated, get as shredded as you can, mm -hmm. get down to 5% body fat where, where you, you move your hand and you, and you have fibers that rip. Yeah. yeah. If you can compete like that, I don't give a shit if you don't even have good muscle shape. If you're that ripped, you will do very well because you're going to make everyone else look smooth. That's and, but what but here's the here's the here's the flip side is it's it's that's the hard way to do it. It's much easier to take to the, the steroids and get big yeah. and you know still muscular. To get that ripped, you got to be dieting, you got to be strict, you got to train, you got to do everything right. Most guys can't do it. You know, that's, uh, I, I just spoke about this, but it'll be good hearing it from you as well. Uh, I routinely have to tell the guys who, who come to me for coaching or just advice or whatever, you don't have as much muscle as you think you do. You're mostly fat. Uh, I mean, uh, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. So I, ha I have these guys come to me like, well, I got a you know, solid foundation. I'm big, I'm bulky. I'm, okay, just send me the pictures. Let me take a look, see. And I say, okay, well, you know, how much fat do you think you have to lose to have a six pack? Let's say about 10 pounds coach. I say, okay, well, number one, it's maybe 40. Uh, how much, how much weight do you actually think you have to lose, you know, to compete or get to your ideal body, whatever. They always say something like 15 or 20 pounds. And my answer is usually 70 or 80 or something. Like it's considerably higher than what they think. Yeah. And this is because most guys, I mean, like, like me, I walk around lean year round. I'm, I'm always lean. I like to be lean. I don't like having, I don't like my six pack going away, not because like I'm vain, but just because I know it means I'm eating a bit too much. That's why I don't like it. I like to have a very controlled life. But I mean, sorry, it's just you know, you know most what? guys just sorry, most guys they just they just don't understand how much fat they literally just have on their body. It's not just that. A lot of guys will look in the mirror and see something that nobody yeah. else sees. Yeah. <laughs> They'll look in their mirror and they'll, you know, they'll flex a little bit. And, oh man, I'm really buff. I'm good, man. I'm good. I, I'm ready to compete. I'm gonna bust these guys off the stage, right? They actually have something in the medical literature. That's body uh, dysmorphia. Is what it is. Of, of the psychology. There's a uh, a guy named Harrison Pope, this uh, psychiatrist who studies anorexia and all these uh, body dysmorphic uh, diseases. He came up. He started looking at bodybuilders. And he realized that a lot of these huge bodybuilders, I'm talking like Mr. Olympia bodybuilders. Bigorexia. Yeah, bigorexia. Right, they'll look in the mirror and they'll say, oh, shit, I'm small, man. I'm yeah. small. And what they do is they take more steroids thinking that they're too small and they fuck themselves up. They get sick. He calls it bigorexia. Well, so it's, a, it's, it's, a lot of times my point is, and a lot of these guys you're talking about, their minds play tricks on them. They see things that are just not there. But it's it's just it seems so many men are deluded about what actual body fat they have, how much muscle they realistically have. We start working together. One of the primary things I always do is I'm like, listen, we gotta check your grip strength, we gotta check, you know, blank to be blank blank. And then why are we checking all these things? I said, because I want to make sure your body's only digesting fat and not muscle. 
Right. And we do it intentionally. So I know no muscle is being lost, but then six months down the road, they're whatever, 15, 20, 30 pounds lighter. And they just like, coach, why am I so skinny? Where's all the muscle? I'm like, you didn't have that much to begin with. That's the problem. Yeah, that's what happens. I feel so small. Coach, I look terrible. I'm like, listen, here's the thing. When I walk around in my normal clothes, not, not like something like this is kind of tight, but like in my normal clothes, I look like a skinny nerd. I mean, well, not like a skinny nerd, I suppose, but like a, a slender male. If I wear something tight fitting or I take my shirt off, I'm shredded. I look great. Everybody, it's all eyes on me though. But I mean, it's a different thing. It's the clothing. It's what you're wearing. Right. Arnold and those guys used to talk about how they would, in the off season when they were off drugs, they'd like make their shirt sleeves super tight and wear three sweaters and stuff. How ridiculous yeah. is that? That's pure it ego. Descent. It's nonsense. Yeah, it is crazy. I mean, uh, you know, th then they have these guys I see in the gym. There's a lot of these guys, I call them gym bodies. You know, they walk around with the tank tops and stuff and they try and show as much. As, sometimes they'll even take their shirt off. And, you know, when you look at them, you say, gee, you know, they're, you know these guys are always on drugs. Needless to say. They well, they got good physiques, yeah. They got good physiques and you look at them and you, and you think, you know, you, you say, you know, maybe, you know, this guy could compete. You know, he's got, he's got delts, he's got good arms and even has calves. But what happens is when they do compete, and I've seen this a lot, when they compete, that's when their shortcomings really show. And they, yeah, they get a lot of these real. guys, when they stand on stage, the same guys that look fantastic in the gym look like shit on stage. Yep. Yep. Like when they pick up their arms, they might have no lats, they have no back development, they have no hamstring. It all shows up in glaring relief when they step on the stage. I call them gym bot. I've mm -hmm. seen a lot of guys like that over the years. You know, I, I still see them today. I saw one just the other day in the gym. I, I talk till I'm blue in the face about the importance of training opposing muscle groups, about hitting every muscle group on your body, why it's important for your biotensegrity, why you need to train your fascia and your tendons. And people, they just want to train their arms and their chest. Yeah. I don't know. I don't understand. I It's not my thing. I get the same questions. I wish I got different questions, but probably the same as you. I get the same questions all the time, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but anyways, let's, um, I suppose let's try to wrap up and summarize. Uh, I think that the main consensus is some guys uh, have better individual morphology or bone structure. They have better genetics, meaning they have higher amounts of angiogen receptors, or they might even have different kinds of muscle fibers, which lend themselves more towards size. Well, that, um, well that's, that's another thing. I, I forgot we didn't get into it, yeah. yeah but no, um, it was your muscle fibers. I mean, if you have like longer muscles, usually mean more muscle fibers. Of course, those guys are going to respond better to the steroids. Mm -hmm. They have more muscle fibers to grow. So that, that's a limitation also. Well, short guy versus tall guy, like you said earlier, I can pack on a lot more muscle than somebody shorter than me. But it, at the same time, it's a lot more stretched out. And it takes a lot longer because I have such uh, larger levers and bones, you know. Right. A biggie, right. a, literally one of the biggest ones I see is guys not sleeping. I'm not even kidding you. This is one of the biggest ones I see is guys not sleeping. How much are you sleeping? Four or five hours a night? I said, okay, double that, and then we'll see some progress. I'll tell you, the research on sleep, uh, especially what's come out, let's say, in the last six months, mm -hmm. is mind-boggling how bad it is when you don't get sleep. Mind-boggling. I, I mean, I've, I've written for years about how just not getting one night of enough sleep defined as, let's say, less than six hours sleep will lower the testosterone, even in a healthy guy, by an average of 15%. That's just one night. But I mean, what it does to your brain, what it does to your cardiovascular, what it does to your body composition, it actually causes you to eat more and, and stimulates you. You get mm -hmm. fat. It's my, I mean, not getting enough sleep is a horrible mistake. It's, it's literally, I, it, actually, this is, it's, it used to be a, a different subjects, but at the moment, for at least the last little while, the consecutive problem I have with every client is them not sleeping enough. And if it's a woman, it's them not sleeping enough and them not eating enough protein. Those yeah. are like the two primary issues I deal with. It's it's never anything like exercise related, focus related, diet. It's always the sleep goddamn thing. I right. get it. I used right. to I used to literally be a chef 18 hours a day. I still work 16 hours a day, yeah. but I prioritize my sleep. I mean, I'm actually to my bedtime right now, as a matter of fact. Oh, so okay. um uh, we'll, we'll be chatting again soon now that I'm, I'm up for it again. We got some more time. So if you could, please, Jerry, everybody knows who you are, but would you just give out your links real quick? Sure. I, I, uh, I have a, a publication called Applied Metabolics. It's at www.appliedmetabolics.com. It's 30 to 45 pages every month. I cover all different kinds of topics. 
I cover more topics, uh, you know, exercise, nutrition, supplement science, uh, ergogenic aids, hormonal therapy. I cover more topics than any of the digital publication. Plus it has my over 60 years of experience and study behind it, which again, cannot be matched by anyone. And I, as I say in my videos, my, my own videos, I point out that anybody who reads Applied Metabolics will almost be an expert after six months of reading. There's so much information in there. So it's a really vital resource, especially good for trainers who want to like, let's say, get further education about proper exercise and proper nutrition to help their clients. But it's useful for anybody. I mean, men and women, it's not specific to men. It, it covers regular health conditions too. You know, besides the bodybuilding and fitness, I cover general health. So I, I think it's a tremendous asset. I wish I, I, I the best compliment I could give my, give that applied metabolics is I wish I had it when I competed. Mm. It would have saved me a lot of headaches and a lot of mistakes. Would have saved I, me a lot. I know. should mention, I mean, I read anytime you put something new out, I reread it all the time. Everything is, uh, he has so many articles, they're all alphabetized. I'm catching up to you. I'm finally catching up to you on articles. But I mean, he, he has so many articles, they're all alphabetized. It's wonderful. And I mean, if, if you don't, if you have trouble reading, if so many people have trouble reading things, Jerry's also all over YouTube. He reads out loud a lot of the pieces from the articles. Me and Jerry yeah. also have, um, I think, 18 or 19 podcasts together now at this point. So check through my podcast. You can see me and Jerry talking about a bunch of other subjects as yeah. well, guys. Oh, and by the way, also, you should mention the Applied Metabolics itself. Let's say somebody doesn't want to read it. They have Microsoft uh, has a program oh, yeah. Yeah. where you flip it on. You know, I think you have to, I'm not sure whether you have to go through their particular browser. I don't know how that works, but I know if you flip it on, it will literally read you the entire newsletter. You could, you know, you don't have to even read your work. Even if you're illiterate, you could, you could get the information. There's a lot of, there's a lot of free phone apps, guys, too. If you didn't know, just go to your Play Store. There's tons of free phone apps. Just right. overlays on top of your screen and it'll read it to you. I use it myself. Right. Uh, but, but that's it. I got to get going to bed. Jerry, thank you hey. so much for coming on. I really appreciate sure. you taking the time. All and right. um, I'll, I'm actually going to email you a couple of things soon. And um, we'll be having you on again as soon as I can, actually. So thanks okay. so much, Jerry. Sounds good. Good to speak to you again. Take care. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye. I hope that you liked that video. I just wanted to remind you all, if you're able to and you support my work, please make sure that you like the video. You subscribe if you haven't already. You click the notification bell and you share this video or leave a comment to help the algorithm. Every little bit helps and I'm trying to get this information to as many people as is possible. And of course, if I can help you with any of your coaching needs, you need a running plan, you need a workout plan, you want to build mass, you want to lose weight, you want to do things correctly, you want a full education about your diet, your exercise, your respiratory health, supplements, and everything else, just contact me at castlinprogress.com or via my email, castlinprogress at gmail.com. If you don't want coaching directly, just check out my Etsy store. It's linked in the description of all of my videos. I have all of my many books, tools, and everything else there. Or finally, check out my Substack. It's linked in a lot of the videos as well. And it's free, a free newsletter where I share the latest science, advice, exercises, and everything else for free. So thank you as always for your support, everyone.